الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Tonight's halaqa or lecture or daras or speech or ta'leem whatever name you wish to call it will be regarding or be similar to what we mentioned before في ظل الجامع الصحيح in the shade of Sahih al-Bukhari Benefiting, learning, studying, reviewing, and discovering new secrets and further depths of Sahih al-Bukhari. That's in general. Specifically speaking on one of the earliest hadiths, one of the very first hadiths mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, and that is the story of Waraka ibn Nawfal. Waraka ibn Nawfal, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Like last night, we talking about Luqman al-Hakim, Luqman the wise, we have different issues and various discussions regarding the person and the personality. Who was Luqman al-Hakim? Who was he? Was he a prophet? Was he a messenger? Where did he live? When did he live? What was his background? What other virtuous or great person, whether prophet or not, was a contemporary with him? We have those masa'in that are important and lead to more knowledge and more information and more science and more wisdom. But the most important thing is the actual story itself. Al-Qissa wa madaminuha. The story itself and what is included in the story. That's the most important thing of Luqman al-Hakim. Is what he said to his son. Wisdom, knowledge, instruction that is beneficial and wholesome for the mind, the spirit, the body, etc. That's the most important thing. And the same applies to the story of Warqa ibn Nawfal. Is what he said to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him, and why Khadija even brought him to Warqa, so on and so forth. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And once again, I thank my hosts. After thanking Allah the Mighty and the Most High, I thank my host for a wonderful time that uh, they have shown us today, uh, taking us around, explaining things to us, showing things. And you have bi'ithin illahi ta'ala the reward from Allah and our gratitude and our appreciation. Secondly, I would like to thank the Imam and the Shaykh of the Masjid and of the Marquez. And of course he speaks on behalf of his uh, ikhwan, wa'wan, his brothers, his helpers, the people that support him, his team. I thank you for the respect and the humility and the warm open door that you have given us. Nashkurukum wa nukhadirukum ala hadha. That's first and foremost. Thirdly, last but not least, I thank each and every one of you, all of you brothers and sisters, for sacrificing your time, for coming out, showing your love, showing your, report, your respect, uh, showing your support. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla an yajma' alakum bayn al-ajri wal fa'idah. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to give you both the reward, the spiritual reward, and the actual tangible benefit. Khayran, insha'Allah. So Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, uh, once more, inshallah, we're going to talk briefly about his book uh, and the importance of his book and the hadith culture. So Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, his book is not called Sahih al-Bukhari, as we said before. Al-Jami' al-Sahih or Al-Jami' al-Musnad al-Sahih al-Mukhtasar Min hadithi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sunnihi wa iyamihi aw bihad al-ma'na some versions say al jami al sahih al jami al musnad al sahih al mukhtasar is the condensed authentic jami a collection a an exhaustive encyclopedic or encyclopedic type of book from the hadith of the prophet the sunnahs of the prophet and the days of the prophet and pay attention to this wording brothers and sisters Imam al-Bukhari, he considered his book to be mukhtasar, summarized. Huh? So many people, they complain about 40 hadith, it's big, it's long, I can't memorize it. Bukhari's book, he considered to be mukhtasar, summarized. And there are many books which are far more exhaustive than Imam al-Bukhari's book. And Imam al-Bukhari's book is called al-jami' And it means that it is supposed to include asnaf al-hadith al-thamaniyah. 
the eight main topics and categories of hadith. The eight main categories and topics and subject matter of hadith. Eight of them. Do we know what those eight are? Does anyone know what those eight asnaf are? And which are supposed to be included in a book that is called a janet. We have a genre. A genre of hadith books. All hadith books are not the same. They're written differently by different authors, different styles, different times, different lengths. And that's because there are asnaf. There are different types of books of hadith. Imam al-Bukhari's book is not a muwatta. Imam al-Bukhari's book is not a musnad, even though it's technically a musnad, but it's not a musnad. Imam al-Bukhari's book is not really a sunan, even though it could be called a sunan, but it's properly called a jami'. It's in the jami' genre. There are different types of hadith books. Now we have genres of sports, movies, music, clothes, different genres. When you go into a superstore, which hour are you going to look in? And within that aisle, there's different types. In the food aisle, the different cultures, different parts of the world, they have different foods and different spices. So Bukhari's book is called Al-Jami'. And from the meaning, or from the meanings of the word Al-Jami'. And the Yashtamilu, it includes and entails the eight main topics and subjects of Hadith. Do we know what those topics are, brothers and sisters? Does anyone know? And if you don't know, would anyone be willing to guess? What are those eight topics? What though? Aqeedah. So it has to have hadiths that talk about what you're supposed to believe in and accept. Tayyip. Salah. Salah is too specific. Salah falls under a broader umbrella. Ibadah or fiqh. Tayyip. Al ibadat. Number three. Now you got more than that. You did the first one, good. The second one, you got to have a third one. Three is the sunnah. Hadith is the hadith. La. <laughs> think, just, 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 just stop and think about life according to Islam and sunnah. Zakat is ibadah. Akhlaq. Yeti dawru, inshallah. Turn by turn, inshallah. We're going to stick here first. Give me one more, I think. Tijara, mu'amala. Think about something else though. All the things the Prophet talked about and spoke about. Think about the end of time. You get Juj, Majuj, Dajjal, the Mahdi. That's Aqidah, but it's more specific. Al Fitan, Wal Malahim. Apocalypse, things, time ending, the Mahdi coming, the Dajjal coming. That's all a part of it as well. Even though that's from Aqidah as well. But it's a more specific concept though. Clear? So he gave us three. Methanin. Al-Ibadat. Or Al-Aqa'id. Or Al-Iman. Al-Ibadat. Fiqh. Salah. Tahara. Etc. And also the things that will come towards the end of time. Then we also mention what? Al-Mu'amalat. Mithil. Al-Bay'i. Shira'a. Mithil. Zid, zidna ya shaykh. La, al akhlaq lays, la, la yadkhul fil muamalat. Al nikah, al talaq, al hidana, these things like this. Methanin. What else? Al tijara, muamalat, bay wa shira. Perfect. Buying and selling. What else? Miraf, that is what? Muamala or ibadah? One of the two for sure. Something else. Think when you go to sleep at night, what happens? Dream interpretation. Ru'ya. Ta'bir al-ru'ya. That's one of the main topics. Dream interpretation. A gem has to have a chapter on what? Dream interpretation. That's a very important aspect of the sunnah. Tell you, what else do we have? What about a tafsir? Kitab of tafsir. In every book which is called a gem, it has to have a section on what? Tafsir of the Qur'an. Tell you, what else? Al-fada'il. Virtues. Al-manaqib. The virtues of the prophets, the virtues of the prophet, the virtues of Abu Bakr, Bilal, Umar, this Kabila, this tribe, etc. Tayyip, what else do we have? A tarikh. Not necessarily. Al ilm. Tayyip. Tazkiyah. Suluk. Tayyip. Anything else? So, Layum al Akhir is going to be included in what? 
Al Iman. Anything else? I want to get the idea. So there could be eight things that the ulama agree on unanimously. Are the eight, or the people can give and take one or two, but it's going to be the eight main that have to be a part of the book. Everyone understand this? So Imam al-Bukhari's book is a book of fiqh, tafsir, aqidah, kullu shay. It's a superstore. Everyone understand this? And that's how he wrote his book. Everybody clear on this? That's how Imam al-Bukhari wrote his book, right? And of, of course, including that is going to be history, tarikh, as you mentioned. Of course. And you guys forgot seerah. Asir, wal maghazi extremely important. The prophetic seerah, his expeditions, his battles, extremely important. And the seerah is the life in 3D. How to practice Islam in 3D. That's what seerah is. Because it's not giving you a theory anymore. What you're supposed to believe in. It's actually showing what the prophet himself did to manifest his belief in this situation. With a friend, with an enemy, at war, at peace, husband, wife, this, 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 and that. It's giving you Islam in reality. The seerah is extremely important, and there's nothing more beneficial for the da'iyah, the caller to Allah, than expertise in seerah. Expertise in seerah. Being strong in the prophetic seerah if you want to be a successful da'iyah. You have to know what the prophet did in this situation, and how to apply it to the modern 2019 San Diego way. Extremely important. Khairan inshallah ta'ala. So Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, the first chapter in his book is called what? Kitab al-Iman. Everyone agrees on this? Everyone agrees on this? What a bad al-Wahi. Ha, Kitab bad al-Wahi or Kitab al-Iman? Which is first? Bad al-Wahi, without a question. But going back to what the brother said, Jazallah Khairan, is Kitab al-Bad al-Wahi an actual book? Or is it kal muqaddima? Ha, some people say yes and some people say no. It's actually kitabu bad al wahi. Now, before we go further, brothers and sisters, if we don't have a good, good grasp of Sayyid Bukhari, what book of hadith will we have a good grasp of? You don't have to memorize all of it, but you have to be familiar with it. Like a supermarket that you go in. You may not know every single aisle, but you got a general idea of where to find the produce versus where to find paper plates. Because you've been in this place, what? So many times. And there's some markets or Walmarts or whatever stores you call them in which you actually know like the back of your hand. And that's how Sayyid Bukhari should be. That's how Sayyid Bukhari should be. You should be extremely familiar with the book. And you should know how to navigate quickly and find what you need to find in the book if you haven't memorized it. I wouldn't understand this type. So therefore, Kitab al-Bad al-Wahid, it states it's the book of the beginning of revelation. The book of the beginning of revelation. So we see that the brothers, some of them they say that it's the first chapter, and others they say, no, bell. Rather, it is a muqaddim and it's a tamheed to the book. Like Imam Muslim wrote a muqaddim to his book. And like Abu Dawud rahimullah wrote, the Risala Sunnah Abu Dawud in Ahli Mecca. And the Tirmidhi rahimullah has Al Ilal al Sagheer. All right? Ibn Majah has muqaddimah, even though it's not no kalam. But it's still some type of taqdeem to it. So the concept of Bukhari telling you about his book and why he wrote his book and the importance of his book via Kitabu Bad Id Wahi. And that's why it's the first hadith, Innam al Amalu or Innam al Amalu bin Niyyah. And this is my intention behind writing this book. It's not you, it's not him, it's not her, but it's to seek the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and explaining and teaching the sunnah. So whether it is an introduction or whether it's actually the first book. The story of Waraka ibn Nofal is mentioned in this kitab. The beginning of revelation. And then after that we have Kitab al-Iman as was mentioned. And Kitab al-Iman is specific to Imam al-Bukhari and a few other scholars who wrote books on Sunan and Jamir. That usage of the word Kitab al-Iman. And it's very different than Imam Muslim's usage of the term. When Imam Muslim says Kitab al-Iman, he's actually saying it's the Kitab of what? Anybody know? Aqidah, exactly. Because he's talking about everything in Kitab al-Iman. From Iman itself, what it is, what it isn't, it rising, it falling. And he also talks about 
the trees in paradise, the Dajjal. He talks about all of the issues in which you're supposed to believe in and accept. But Imam al-Bukhari, when he says Kitab al-Iman, that's not what he means. He means what? Imam al-Bukhari means Taqriru madhab ahl al-hadith fil iman wa rad ala al Imam al-Bukhari, he means establishing the orthodox creed regarding iman and refuting the false, fake creeds regarding iman. So Imam al-Bukhari, Kitab al-Iman is only talking about what? One thing, and that is al-Iman. He's not talking about the Dajjal, he's not talking about the Mahdi, he's not talking about Ya'juj or Majuj. He's not talking about this issue and that issue, Arkan al-Islam, the, 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 no. He's talking about what is al-Iman, it's reality. And the establishment that it increases and it decreases, and it's in the heart, it's upon the tongue, the limbs, etc. He's establishing the aqidah about the sunnah, and he's refuting the murji'ah, and the khawarij, and the mu'tazila, and anyone else, man khalaf, who's wrong in that chapter. And that's not the intention of Imam what? Muslim. I would understand this. So Iman is used generally and also specifically. I would understand this. And that's why Imam al-Khari has kitab with tawheed, which is more focused on the sifat, and uh, sifat al-kalam, and the Qur'an, and things like this. Al al ibad and things like this is broader, but even still, he's yuqarir wa yurud. Yuqariru wa yuruddu. Alright? So, Bad ul wahi, the chapter of the beginning of Revelation, leads you into Kitab ul Iman. It leads you into Kitab ul Iman. And that is where we actually find the narration, the narration of Waraka ibn Nawfal. How the revelation began. What you to believe in, so on and so forth. Khayran, inshallah. So this is nothing more than dipping and dabbing into what we say, the hadith culture. That's not the, 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 the topic of our lecture right now. But we are on a mission out here in San Diego. And we are propagating something and pushing something. And that is to establish, to maintain the culture of hadith. There's no doubt about that. That I'm biased with regards to that. That's what we're trying to push and promote. And we're trying to give you a better appreciation and a better understanding, and a better love for Sahih al-Bukhari. And that's far more beneficial than a lecture that I can give you. If you sat with me, you came and you benefited, and you walked away with having a new life with Bukhari, that's better than just hearing my words, and this means that, and this fight and that fight. Everyone understand this? Is that you can walk away with having a greater understanding of the kutub of hadith, especially Imam al-Bukhari's book, and if you came with one fact, or if you came, if you left with one or two fighters from the actual lecture, then alhamdulillah. But the most important thing is the propaganda. And as pushing and pumping Sahih Bukhari, and pushing and pumping the culture of hadith. Khayran insha'Allah ta'ala. So therefore, let's read this uh, chapter. Let's see what Imam al-Bukhari ta'ala has to say regarding the narration of Waraka ibn Nawfal. Imam al-Bukhari ta'ala, he says... Babun. And anyone that would like to read, inshallah, I know the students of knowledge is haq. I know you guys, I know you're carrying your Sayyid Bukhari with you. Wherever you go, it's in your car, right? If it's not in your car, it's in your pocket or your phone. I know you have your Sayyid Bukhari with you all of the time, right? And if his haq doesn't have it, then Mukarram has it for sure. There's no doubt about that. That's the foundation of the way of the Salaf al Salih. Is, is this type of book, Sayyid Bukhari. For sure, Mukarram has it, right, Abu Sayyid? No doubt it. If he doesn't have it on him, he has it in his trunk, in his backseat of his car. You don't drive around with Sayyid Bukhari with you? I'm disappointed. Huh? How many masjids? He said, no, we can't go there, we don't go there. But what, what am I here? here? What, do I, what am I in this masjid for? If you don't have Sayyid Bukhari with you, Ishaq has to have it. Sheikh Imam has to have it. I know he has it. He won't disappoint me. Akhuna, sahibuna, fissarai wa darai, Sheikh. The hardships that we went through yesterday. Akhul al nas wala. Aha. Tahir, okay. Sport, huh? Fakat, who is sports, huh? I know you have Sayyid Bukhari, right? In his mind. Allahu Akbar. Tahir. Imam al Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala he says, Babun, Hadathana Yahya bin Bukhayrin, Kala Hadathana Laythu, An Ukailin, An ibn Shihabin, An Urubata bin Zubayri, An Aisha, Umin Muminin, An Hakalat, Awuluma Budi Abi Hiro Sulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Min al Wahi Ruya Sali Hatuf in Nome, Fakana la Yara Ruya illa Jaat Mithla Falakis Subh, 
ثم حبب إليه الخلاء وكان يخلو بغار حراء فيتحنث فيه هو تعبد الليالي ذوات العدد قبل أن ينزع إلى أهله ويتزود لذلك ثم يرجع إلى خديجة فيتزود لمثلها حتى جاءه لحقه في غار حراء فجاءه الملك فقال أقرأ قال ما أنا بقارئ قال فأخذني فغطني حتى بلغ مني الجهد ثم أرسلني فقال يقرأ قلت ما أنا بقار فأخذني فغطني الثانية حتى بلغ مني الجهد ثم أرسلني فقال أقرأ قلت فقلت ما أنا بقار فأخذني فغطني الثالثة ثم أرسلني فقال أقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم إلى آخر الآيات فرجع بها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يرجف فؤاده فدخل على خديجة بنت خويلد رضي الله عنها فقال زملوني زملوني فزملوه حتى ذهب عنه الروع فقال لخديجة وأخبرها الخبر لقد خشيت على نفسي فقالت, خجين فقالت خديجة كلا والله ما يخزيك الله أبدا إنك لتصل الرحم وتحمل الكل وتكسب المعدوم وتقر الضيف وتعين على نوائب الحق فانطلقت به خديجة حتى أتت به ورقة بن نوفل بن أسد بن عبد الأزة ابن عم خديجة وكان مرعا تنصر في الجاهلية وكان يكتب الكتاب العبرانية فيكتب من الإنجيل بالعبرانية ما شاء الله أن يكتب وكان شيخا كبيرا قد عمي فقال رضي خديجة يا ابن عم اسمع من ابن أخيك فقال له ورقة يا ابن أخي ماذا ترى فأخبره رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خبر ما رأى فقال له ورقة هذا الناموس الذي نزل الله على موسى يا ليتني فيها جذعا ليتني أكون حيا إذ يخرجك قومك فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو مخرجهم قال نعم لم يأتي رجل قط بمثل ما جئت به إلا عودي وإن يدركني يومك أنصرك نصرا مؤزرا ثم لم ينشب ورقة أن توفي وفتر الوحي إمام البخاري رحمه الله تعالى he says Babun. He doesn't give it a specific chapter heading. He gives no specific chapter heading, rather he says Babun. And then he says Hadathana Yahya ibn Bukair. He quotes from his teacher Yahya ibn Bukair. So Yahya ibn Bukair is his first sheikh. Yahya, the son of Bukair. And this, what we're reading right here, is what we call Al Isnad. Al Isnad. And every single Muslim should know. That the hadith has two parts Al Isnad wal Matin or Sanad wal Matin. Every Muslim should know that. Every Muslim, not just a student of hadith, every Muslim must know that. The basic components of a hadith. So Al Bukhari, rahimahullah, listen carefully. He narrates from his teacher, Yahya ibn Bukhair. So Al Bukhari, rahimahullah, was once sitting down on the carpet, on the floor, and let's say, I'm Yahya ibn Bukhair, and you're Imam Al Bukhari. And before you pass them on to your students or put it in your notes or your book, you say, Haddathana, that Yahya ibn Bukair told us. And where did I get it from? Me being Yahya ibn Bukair, I got it from who? I got it from a man whose name was what? Haddathana Layth. Layth ibn Sa'd, rahimahullah ta'ala. That's my teacher. And Layth ibn Sa'd, he got it from a man whose name was? Uqail. And Uqail got it from a man whose name was? Ibn Shihab. And Ibn Shihab, Ibn Shihab got it from? Ha. Urwa Ibn Zubair. Who got it from? Aisha. Aisha. It's a simple, that's an easy isnad in Sayyid Bukhari. Going back, the first person in the center was who? Ha. Yahya Ibn Ukair. From? Layth. From? Layth reported from who? لا, not from Ibn Shihab. That's Munqatiq now. He got it from? Uqayl ibn Khalid ibn Aqil al-Aili. Who got it from? Ibn Shihab. Who's Ibn Shihab? Zuhri. What's his name? Muhammad ibn Ubaidillah. Ibn Shihab is way up there. His grandfather's. Tayyip. Who was his kunya? What was his lineage? 
When did he die? What century did Zuhri live in? It's all the things that student knowledge, hadith has to what? You gotta know. You gotta have this in your head on point. Ibn Shihab is a student of Urwa ibn Zubair, who heard it, who got it from Aisha, Umm al Mu'mineen. And what did Aisha say? Listen carefully, and I'm gonna throw another curve at you. And Khalik Mai. I'm gonna throw another trick at you now. Aisha, listen carefully. She says, the very first thing that the Prophet ﷺ got and received was what? A good positive dream. A dream that he had. Is Hal Hada Yani Mutasr? Ishwa. Was Aisha alive when he became a prophet and a messenger? No. So who is her source? Is Haq. From the Prophet? Or is it someone else? Abu Bakr. Maybe. Who where is she getting this report from? So technically speaking, this this is what? Is it Irsal? Abu Ubaid? Ada Mursan. Bilashak. Aisha didn't what? She didn't see it. She wasn't there. And she doesn't say, someone told me, Fulan told me, she says, Oh, She's telling the story as if what? She was there. She's removing her, her wasita, her middle man or middle woman. I would understand this. Aisha, she didn't get this from the what? You with me, Muawiyah? Aisha, she didn't what? She wasn't there. How does she know the first thing that the Prophet ﷺ received and got? She got it from somewhere else. We know it's authentic. That's not, that's not, had the laysalish. That's not the problem. But I'm trying to show you the sciences of hadith and the precision. I don't understand this? Tayyip. So, Aisha, she says, the very first thing that was brought to the Prophet ﷺ of revelation was a dream that he saw. A ru'ya saliha. A beautiful and positive dream. فَكَانَ لَا يَرَى رُؤْيَ إِلَّا جَاءَتْ مِثْلَ فَلِقِ الصُّبْحِ And every dream that will come to him its interpretation, mithla falak as subh, like the daybreak, it will be plain and it will be manifest, clear as day. The reality and the meaning of the dream. Everyone understand this? The dream itself. Then she says, thumma hubiba ilayhi al And then the Prophet became fond of being by himself, secluding himself, and avoiding the filth of jahiliyyah and shirk and the people and the hustle and the bustle of the city. He wanted to be by himself. He wanted to make a spiritual retreat away from that stuff. That was the thing that he was fond of. And he went to the place that says, وَكَانَ يَخْلُوا بِغَارِ حِرَى فَيَتَحَنَّثُ فِيهِ And then he would go to this cave or the mouth of this cave called Hira. فَيَتَحَنَّثُ فِيهِ And in that cave he would make, he would do something called التَّحَنُّثُ The narration then says, وَهُوَ التَّعَبُّدْ Al-layali dhawat al-adad. Ma, ma yusamma hadha fi ilm al-hadith. Jumlat wa huwa ta'abud. Al-layati, al-layali dhawat al-adad. Hadha tafsir. Lakin hadha laysa al-ism al-mustalah alayh. This is called what? Mudraj. Bil-fat. Mudraj. Laysa mudraj. Mudraj. Ahsant. That's called what? Mudraj. Wa sabab al-idraj huwa tafsir. كلمة على إدراج على أقسام وله أسباب أسنتما This is called مدرج This is interpolated This isn't the wording of who? Of Aisha Aisha she said the word تحنث And then another narrator came behind her and said وهو كذا 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 Because the تحنث isn't a very commonly used word I understand علم الحديث and its application I understand it's طيب Moving forward um, she says, قبل أن ينزع إلى أهله ويتزود لذلك And he would take the necessary provisions. He would go to his wife, meaning Khadija, before he would return back to the cave. طيب, moving forward. حتى جاءه الحق وهو في غار حراء Until the point in which the truth came to him. She called it the truth, Allahu Akbar. جاءه الحق And he was in that cave. فجاءه الملك and the angel came to the Prophet ﷺ, came to the messenger, and he said, Iqra. What does this word mean? Does Iqra mean read, or does Iqra mean recite? And there's a word of difference between the two. Recite or read? 
It means read. So what was the Prophet's response? He was commanded to say Iqra. He says, Ma anabi? Qari. Could the Prophet not recite? But he couldn't read. Or he could read, but he wasn't considered to be a reader. Everyone understand this? There's a difference between this. Someone asked me, says, Mufti, we want you to recite the Quran. We want to listen to your recitation. I says, I'm not a reciter of the Quran. Doesn't mean that I can't recite the Quran. I've never studied it, but I don't consider myself to be a reciter of the Quran. My voice, my skills, my, I don't consider myself to be a qari. Basic proficiency, one thing. I've studied it, I've memorized it. Doesn't mean that I consider myself to be a what? A qari. Brother Fulan is a reciter. His voice is beautiful. His tajweed is impeccable. He's kether, he's kether. He doesn't drink gold things. He doesn't eat stuff like this. Everyone understand this? He knows this qira'a, that qira'a, that qira'a. Everyone understand this concept? So we know that there is discrepancy with regards to did the Prophet said read and write. Could he read or could he not write? Was so on and so forth? Was he illiterate or not? Al Muhim, the, the, the Malik, he says, Iqra, read, slash, recite. The Prophet وسلم, says, I'm not a qari. What it means to read or to recite. And then Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he enveloped him. Uh, he gave him a great big squeeze. فَغَطَّنِي حَتَّى بَلَغَ مِنِّ الْجَهْدِ He squeezed me so tightly, I could barely breathe. He almost killed me. And then he let me go. And he said, read a second time and a third time. حَتَّى بَلَغَ مِنِّ الْجَهْدِ Right? And then Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقْ Etc to the end of the ayat. And he told him those ayat from Surah uh, Al-Alaq. Then it says, فَرَجْعَ بِهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم يَرْجُفُ فُؤَادُهُ So the Messenger of Allah he was afraid, he was scared, he was terrified, he was shaking and trembling. فَدَخَلَ عَلَى خَدِيجَةِ بِنْتُ خُوَيْلِدٍ رَضِي الْعَنْهَا فَقَالَ زَمِّلُونِي زَمِّلُونِي He entered upon Khadija and he says, cover me up, I'm cold, I'm shaking, I'm scared. Cover me up, cover me up. فَزَمَّلُوهُ And that's what they did. حَتَّى ذَهَبَ عَنْهُ الرَّوْعَ Until he calmed down. And he settled down. Alright? The narration then says uh, that Khadija رضي الله he told Khadija what happened. And he said, لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ عَلَى نَفْسِي I'm afraid, I'm scared. I'm afraid and I'm scared. I was afraid for myself and what happened out there. And moving forward, the narration it then says, فَقَالَتْ Khadija she said, have no fear. Don't worry. Allah won't shame you. Allah shall never disgrace you. Regardless of what happened, what you saw, how you feel, one thing for sure that I know is that Allah will not shame you. Why won't Allah shame me? Why won't Allah humiliate me? Why won't Allah disgrace me? Khadija, she said, these are the reasons why Allah will not disgrace you. إِنَّكَ لَتَصِلُ الرَّحِمْ وَتَحْمِلُ الْكَلْ وَتَكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُومِ وَتَقْرِ الضَّيْفِ وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ Because you're a good person and you're a great person. You're good and you're great. Those less fortunate, those who aren't so well off, those people who are looked down upon and trotted upon and trampled upon in society, you think about them and look after them. Whether they're orphans, whether they're wayfarers, travelers, guests, لَتَصِلُ rahim, You keep the relations between your kin and your kid. You're an impeccable person, and it's impossible for Allah to humiliate and to shame an impeccable person. Look at the virtue of husnul khuluq in Islam. The excellent status of husnul khuluq from day one. Perf perfect moral character. That's why Allah will not disgrace you. Khadija radiallahu she gave these uh, beautiful words of encouragement to the Prophet And then from the beauty of Khadija radiallahu not only did she talk and speak, but she also did. Jama'at bayn al-qawli wal fi'l. She then physically took him to the man whom we want to talk about and discuss tonight, Waraqa ibn Nawfal. So she gave him the encouragement, she supported him, she helped him, and then she wanted to take him to someone that could give him more. Take him to someone that could explain more and calm him down more and encourage him more. So it says here, حَتَّى أَتَتْ بِهِ وَرَقَى إِبْنِ نَوْفَلِ بِنِ أَسِدْ بِنِ عَبْدِ الْعُزَى إِبْنِ عَمِّ خَدِيجَةِ Who was related to Khadija, Ibn Ammiha, the son of her uncle. 
meaning a cousin, the son of her uncle. And he was a man who was different than the other Qurashis and Hashimis. And that was he chose to take a different religion. He chose to take another religion. He apostated and left their way of shirk and he chose to take something else and that was he was a Nasrani. He was a Christian. He adopted the Christian faith and obviously that's a long discussion in itself. How rare that was and the challenges that came with leaving the way of the Mushrikun. So Waraka, he was a Christian. وَكَانَ يَكْتُبُ الْكِتَابَ الْإِمْرَانِي فَيَكْتُبُ مِنَ الْإِنْجِيلِ بِالْإِبْرَانِيَةِ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَكْتُبُ and he knew other languages, such as Ibrania, which is what? Hebrew. And he wrote the Injil in Hebrew. So this goes to show that Waraka was learned. He was alim, he had ilm. Much more than the average pagan, the average mushrik, and the average person of Quraysh, etc. وَكَانَ شَيْخًا كَبِيرًا قَدْ And he was very, very old. He was extremely up there in age, or he was up there in age. So Khadija, she said, Ya ibn Am, isma mibni akhik. She says, Oh my cousin, listen to what this man has to say. So Warqi says, Ya ibn Akhi, he says, What did you see? And the Prophet told him what he saw. He told him what happened. He told him what happened to him. And Warqa said, Hadha na Musa alladhi nazzal Allahu ala Musa. He says, This angel that Allah sent your way that came to you is the same angel that came to Musa i.e. the scriptures, the faith, all in succession. Musa والسلام, was a prophet and a messenger. He received revelation. And inshallah ta'ala, you're a prophet and a messenger. And you have received that revelation. The same one who brought it to Musa is the one who brought it to you. And then Waraka, he began to show some of his regret. And how he was upset. And he, he wished that he would be given the young age and the youthful years to be around when things really start to boil. And the top of the pot, the lid, pops off. And there's major conflict between you and the teachings that you have received, like Musa received those teachings, and those people who will refuse those teachings. Woe to me if I was alive, if I was young, if I was strong, I would go out there and I would be on the front lines fighting with you myself. That's what he said to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. Laytani akunu hayyan idh yukhrijuka qawmuka. He says, if I was alive, when your people banish you and kick you out. The Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, I will mukhriji yuhum. My people kick me out? How could this be? I'm not harming them. I'm not doing anything to them. They know I'm not a liar. I'm not a madman. I'm not crazy. Only thing I'm doing is telling them what happened, the truth. How could they possibly kick me out? And that's when Waraka gave him golden advice. And golden advice to all callers to Islam. Is that no one will bring what you're bringing them. Illa udiya. Except that someone is going to hate you. Everyone is not going to like you. It's not going to be taqbeel al aidi wa ru'us. Kissing you on the hand and the forehead. MashaAllah. There are going to be people that are going to hate you. Envy you. Talk bad about you. They're going to be Muslims, non-Muslims alike, monastics, zindiks, fake imposter people. They're going to try to destroy you for no sin and no crime except for calling the people to that which is good. So know that for sure. And if your skin is weak and thin, and if your body is frail, and if you worry about someone talking about you and making scandal about you, and someone not giving you the salams, and you're not welcome in this masjid, and if you're afraid of what the people think about you, then don't quit your day job. Do not get involved with dawah if you have thin skin. Because you're going to make plenty of enemies. And I'm telling you from personal life experience, not out of a book. Those enemies will come from people that you can never ever imagine. It could be your own blood, your family, your father, your mother, your brother, your wife, your husband. They could hate you for what you're trying to do. It could be someone who's a close friend, a companion, a student, a teacher. Someone that you used to play around with in a sandbox with. You used to fight in school. You used to eat lunch together, so on and so forth. You used to share this and that when you were younger. That person could envy you, could hate you, and could fight you. So whatever you bring of what Musa والسلام, brought, Illa he's going to be hated. Someone who's going to show some enmity towards him. Uh, the hadith then says, قال نعم. لم يأتي رجل قط بمثل ما جئت به إلا عودي وإن يدركني يومك 
ansurka nasran muazzaran warqa says and if your day comes then i will support you greatly i will support you greatly thumma lam yanshab and of course warqa he didn't survive allah did not will for him to live that long and the days of the prophet sallallahu and when things would explode and reach the boiling point warqa didn't make it and that's the end of the narration here tayyib so before we get into the story and its meaning and its benefit first question is was warqa a believer was he a believer was waraka a muslim and a mu'min based off of this text can we say that waraka was a muslim and a mu'min jazakallah khairan thank you was waraka a believer he said he would support the prophet if he was alive tayyib everyone unanimously agreed that he was a believer based off of this text what do you say he wasn't a believer Tayyip? From the text. It doesn't, it doesn't necessitate that he was a what? A believer. Tayyip, could you give us, let's say if the brothers and the sisters here, they say, well, it's clearly saying, if, if, I will, I will, I will. And he believed in the previous things. He's believing in him by saying he would support him, he would help him out. How is it not making him a believer? Could you mention another Sira story that shows someone supporting the prophet? Someone can say that. What Nasran Muazzaran did Abu Talib give? And he clearly wasn't a what? A believer. So now we have an argument now. Can we say that supporting someone and helping someone and putting their life on the line, is that a shahada? Some say yes and some say no. This is the beginning of the revelation. The detailed knowledge, the system of the deen wasn't what? It wasn't yet? Send them. The shahadatain umirtu anu qatil nas hatta yashhadu hatta yaqulu. It wasn't there yet. So some people say, based off of this text, kana mu'minan. And he was a believer. And some of them say that he was the second believer after Khadija. The first man to believe. Not Abu Bakr, not Ali, not this one, Bilal, that one, Warqa. And then some of the ulama they say, kana sahabiyan. He was a companion of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and therefore he say, radiallahu anhu. Some of the ulama and researchers, they hold this view. And others they may say, based off of this text, this text is insufficient to say he was a what? A believer. And the sheer promise of supporting and helping, la yistalza minhu al-iman. It doesn't mean that a person is a mu'min, let alone the fact that for him to believe in the Prophet, did he have to make a secondary acknowledgement because he was already a... Christian. So that's a discussion by itself. So we know for sure that he was, he was upon the concept of monotheism. He wasn't upon shirk. By him being a Nasrani during, in, in those times, hypothetically speaking, he was closer to the Tawheed than they were, hypothetically speaking. So this is Mahal Niza, yani, the people that differ was he a believer, was he a Muslim, and was he a Sahabi? Now we have other texts, there are other hadiths that state positivity regarding waraqa. Such as the hadith that says, La tasubbu waraqa. Do not curse waraqa. Because he was a believer. And other texts, other hadiths that state that I saw waraqa alayhi thiyabun bidun. And he was wearing white garments, white clothes. And if he was from the people of the fire, he wouldn't have on white clothes, the narration says. And the other narration says, He says, I saw Waraka having what? Two gardens. So there are other texts outside of this hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, are you authentic or not? Al Muhim, Nusus, what are that? That Waraka was seen by the Prophet to be upon some type of what? Good and positivity. Everyone understand this? So many of the ulama and researchers and tulab al-im, they hold the view that Waraka was a Muslim. And that he was a mu'min. And some of them say he was a Sahabi. Some say he was the first male Sahabi was he laqi an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa mu'minan bihi. And it is no proof that he died upon other than that. I would understand this. But that's not the most important part of the story. As I just said. Was Luqman Nubian? Was he a prophet? Was he this? That's not the what? The most important part of the story. The most important part of the story was what he said. He was admonishing his son. That's Aham Shay. So the most important thing is not to get caught up in these details, but they are important. 
and it's from studying and learning Islamic studies. Right. Point number two is this narration doesn't state uh, and it doesn't uh, make an explicit uh, mention of the status of Waraka among his people and how Waraka was considered to be a pioneer and a trailblazer and he was from among the four men the four men who had a status in discussing and determining the future of Quraysh and Bani Hashim with regards to their religious identity and direction. Those who were Christian, those who renounced the worship of idols, and they said this is not the way of Ibrahim and Ismail. I would understand this. They spoke on this and they talked about this. The pagan Arabs weren't completely just void of intellect. They discussed and they talked about why are we worshiping these idols? Where has it come from? And who was the one who perverted the pure way of Ismail? I would understand this. this is crucially important to understand Tawheed and Shirk. To understand what Tawheed is and what Shirk is. And what the Arabs of the time of the Prophet were not. They were not people who did not know Allah. They were not people who rejected Allah 100%. That's not true. And that is not the definition of Tawheed. They knew Allah. They loved Allah. And they worshipped Allah. Their problem is that they did not make ifrad. They didn't sing a lot of Allah. They knew Allah was the greatest. When they were at sea, and they were about to die, and the ship was about to be snapped in half by the violent waves and the wind. They called upon Allah alone with any partner. Allah says that when we gave them refuge, when we rescued them to the, to the shore, what did they do? They make shirk again. So they knew that Allah was the only one. They knew this, but they had a problem with Tawheed, singling him out in worship. And that's a very long discussion with regards to the Ash'ari Aqeedah, what is Tawheed, Tawheed al rububiyyah Al-Qudra, al ikhtira all of that kalam stuff. Studying the Surah, the Surah prevents you from those taqabbutat of what the misunderstanding of Tawheed is and is. And everyone understand this? So, so these people here, they sat and they discussed and they talked about what they were doing. And some of them clearly said it's wrong. And it's bothered and it's false. And others, they knew it was wrong, but they just went with the flow. And Waraka was from those people who said, I'm not necessarily going to curse them and say that they're wrong and this and that, but I'm definitely going to remove myself from it. And he did that by becoming a, a Christian, a Nasrani. I would understand it. Someone who's supposed to be upon monotheism. And hypothetically speaking, the Christian, the problem, what is the problem between the Christian and the Muslim? It's going to be what? Hypothetically speaking, it's supposed to be what? What is it supposed to be? That, hypothetically speaking, is not supposed to be Tawheed. A true, organic, orthodox Christian is not supposed to be Tawheed. We know that's a problem, those who call themselves Christians making shirk. But that's not supposed to be the problem. Ha ha, the hua. That's supposed to be the problem is the shahadat that Muhammad is Rasul. Everyone understand this? Hypothetically speaking, we said. There's supposed to be someone who believes Allah is one. He has no partner, he has no son, that's made up. Trinity, that's all nonsense. And the, the, hypothetically speaking, when you go and talk to this Christian, you're supposed to focus on telling him and teaching him what? Is that there was another prophet who came after? Christ, quote unquote. And you have to believe in him and accept him because, this is what Christ said, because this is what's mentioned, Mary, the story. So everyone understand this? This is very important here. So, so Warqa was one of those four men who was very influential with regards to the discussion and the debate of Ibadatul Asnam. And you can only find this story mentioned in the books of Sia and not in Sayyid Bukhari. Everyone understand this? Tight. So that's enough of those muqaddimat. Now let's dig into the story. Let's dig into the story. So the first point that we take from the story is, um, of course, there are tons of benefits with regards to him in the cave and Khadija and Jibril. Well, we don't, we don't wish to discuss that. We only want to focus on his interaction with what? Waraka. So the first fact of this story is Fas'alu ada dhikri in kuntum la Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So Khadija could give him only but so much. She could give him only but so much. But there's someone who perhaps knows more. There's someone that can explain more. There's someone who can calm you down even more, and that is this alim, this learned man named Waraka. So if you don't know, and if you're confused, 
and you need further guidance and advice, you should go to the ulama. Go to the people of knowledge. Go to the learned people and ask their advice and benefit from their expertise. And this is the Fa'idah Aziza. Fa'idah number two from the story. This goes to show us, oftentimes, uh, the hypocrisy, it shows the hypocrisy of Quraysh. As Waraka had done what? What did Waraka do? What was his crime and his sin? He did what? Safa ahlamuhum. Wasabba abauhum. He called them foolish and stupid. And he cursed their forefathers and ancestors by doing what? By doing what, Ikhwan? He's a sabit. He left their way. He left their way. So why did they hate the Prophet so much? And show so much war against the Prophet? And Waraka did the what? Pretty much. He wasn't a person who worshipped idols. Everyone understand this? And this is the case of all people of Kufr and Shirk and people of falsehood is that they're hypocritical. They hate someone, they show I doubt with to somebody and someone who's their friend or someone here there, they say nothing about them. They don't lift up a hair regarding that person. But you, they put all of their focus on you and saying it's wala and bara. That's not true. They should have cursed waraqa, kicked out waraqa, and accused waraqa of being all of those bad things that they called the Prophet. So everyone understand this? And that's why they call him Ibn Abi Kabshah. And that's why they call him a Sabit. Those who worship the stars, those who look to the constellations for worship because they had left off the way of Quraysh and as the ibadah of the Asnam. Everyone understand this? Moving forward. This hadith also goes to show us is that there are different levels of evil and there are different levels of misguidance. A person being from Ahlul Kitab versus a person being a mushrik. Marrying a woman who's from Ahlul Kitab, eating their slaughter meats, them living among Ahlul Dhimma is a difference. There are levels of kufr and shirk and misguidance, their levels. This also goes to show us uh, is that the people who came before the Prophet ﷺ, what were they? That's another proof and another argument. Those who say that Waraka was a believer, they'll say, Kanamin Ahl al Fatra. He was from the people between the messengers, in which you can't necessarily say he was a kafir or a mushtik because he was upon the original way of monotheism. And the previous or the last message was the message of. Isa alayhi salam, before the message of the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad alayhi salam. Everyone understand this? And that's a very long discussion in itself. This hadith also was to show us the virtue of ilm, fadilatul ilm. And the thing that made waraqa superior was that he had the ability to do what? Yaktub. And we all know that literacy was scarce among the Arabs. And a man who could swim, a man who could shoot an, uh, an arrow, a man who could ride a horse, a man who, did, who knew poetry, who poetry genealogy, and a man who could write was considered to be from the what? Perfect man. He was a perfect man if he, could do, if he had all of those skills. And writing was one of those skills. So this hadith shows the virtue of ilm. He had knowledge of the book, he had knowledge of the kitab, and he knew another language. And as one of my teachers told me, uh, the sheikh in Medina, sheikh, uh, uh, he said once we were, we, were tra- we were doing a lecture for the brothers in Canada. Uh, and the Canadian brothers, they invited me over their house it's the first time I met this sheikh, very beautiful sheikh from Medina, College of Hadith. Uh, and he, trans- he, he did the lecture for the brothers, and I was translating on the phone. So after the lecture, uh, I said, Jazakallah khairan ya sheikh, it was a pleasure to meet you. And the brothers and the sisters, they send their gratitude to you. They thank you for the benefit that you gave them on the phone. And the sheikh said, Limada. I said, what do you mean? He says, why? I says, what do you mean? I'm thanking you for the lecture. He says, what lecture did I give them? He says, I didn't give them any lecture. I didn't tell them anything. He says, you gave them the lecture. And you gave them the benefits. And the people in Canada, they only benefited from your words because they don't speak my language, they speak English. And as we were leaving the apartment, he says, Man lughatayni, asbaha rajulain. He says, he who learns a double language becomes a double man. He who learns a second language is now in a second person. So he says, your people, you speak to them, you teach them, you convey the message. I can say whatever I want to say. I can quote whatever I want. But it's in what? Arabic. And you speak the language of your people. In actuality, without you, they wouldn't have benefited from what I said. I would understand the concept of lugha, of language, and the power of language. And it's deeper than just a language, but what you say. Because you can speak perfect English, but it doesn't mean you speak the language of the people, the culture of the people, the lingo of the people. And you don't necessarily have the ability to articulate and express yourself to the people. So language is critical. 
And we learn that from this hadith and from many other hadiths. Khairan insha'Allah. Another benefit we take from this hadith, وَكَانَ شَيْخًا كَبِيرًا قَدْ عَمِيَا He was a very old shaykh who became blind. As when Allah takes one thing from you, He gives you something else. And just because a person is old, it doesn't mean that they're useless. And that's something that many young people think and feel, and that's wrong. Don't think that a person is useless because they're old. Don't think they're outdated and they're out-fashioned, or old-fashioned is no use, and don't think that, and that's wrong. And when we talk about respecting the youth, and empowering the youth, and passing the baton to the youth, it does not mean at the expense of disrespecting the old heads. It does not mean that. مَنْ لَمْ يَرْحَمْ صَغِيرُنَا وَيَعْرِفْ حَقَّ كَبِيرِنَا فَلَيْسَ مِنَّا It's a balance. And as that old sheikh uh, in Canada as well, a Somali sheikh, Masjid Khalid bin Walid, he said to the youth after I gave the lecture, he says, Wallah, we have no problem with giving the youth the power to the masjid in the building. The youth can run it. We have no problem with this. He says, but who's going to pay the water bill? Who's going to pay the electric bill from their pockets when there's not enough money from the donations? What young man is going to pull out his wallet and say, I'll pay to keep the markets open? Who's going to make the sacrifices that the older brothers made? So many youth, they complain about the older people, they talk about the older people, but they don't have a clue and an idea how much sacrifice is included in being an older person running something. So don't disrespect the elders. Just because a person is old and aged, it doesn't mean that they're useless. The next faida from the hadith, فَقَالَتُ Khadija. يَا بْنَ عَمْ إِسْمَعْ مِبْنِ أَخِيك is a tawadud, uslub a tawadud fi da'wa is that you have to seek closeness and affection with the person that you wish to call he didn't say man, woman, person ibn am, ibn akhik ya bunayya you speak to someone and you talk to them in a way that which you touch their hearts ya ghulam oh young man inni mu'allimuka kalimat the next faida after that uh, is belief al-imanu bil malaika and then the next faida is al-imanu bil rusul and the next faida is the permissible of wishing and hoping ya laytani the permissibility of wishing and hoping I wish if only it's nothing wrong with saying that if only I could do this if only I'm alive when this happens if only I was there wa and the mushkila the problem of saying lo or in the past is a tasakhut ala al-qadr as you not being pleased and submitting to the qadr. Oh man, I should have done this. If I only would have done that. Man, I knew I should have turned. No, no, don't say that. It was decreed for you to get into the car accident. It mattered not. Good driver, bad driver, lights on. It was meant to be. It was written. So it's a difference in using low and late and things like this. The next fight that we take here is the virtue of youth. Fadl al-shabat. The virtue of being young. And the virtue of having physical strength and physical vigor and energy. And that there are many of your goals and things that you wish to accomplish that you cannot do when you're older. You want to do it, but you're just too old. You don't have the ability to get up and do it. You don't have the energy. So being young is a blessing. It's a blessing having strength, having the energy, having the ability to do it. And moving forward. Uh, this hadith also goes to show us is that there is love and that there is hate. And that there will be people who will love you and there will be people who will hate you. The hadith also says, Will they kick me out? This goes to show us that the Prophet ﷺ, The Prophet does not know the unseen. And it's impermissible to say that the Prophet knows what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to be, what's going to take. He doesn't know that. Unless Allah gives him that information. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ says, They're going to kick me out? He didn't know that. And the next fight that we take from this is the permissibility جواز التعجب من قول الشيخ والأستاذ جواز التعجب من كلمة تخرج من شيخك وأستاذك as a word that comes from your teacher's mouth sometimes it's permissible to be amazed and to ask and to question it really شيخ أو مخرجيهم that's what he said to him أو مخرجيهم they'll kick me out he couldn't believe that that his own tribe his own clan his own kid, his own kin would have the nerve and the audacity and the disrespect to kick him out of his own homeland. It shows that. So it's permissible to ask your teacher a question or to be amazed in a certain light. As long as it's not done disrespectfully. The next benefit we take from this, Naam, لَمْ يَأْتِي رَجُلٌ قَطُّ بِمِثْلِ مَا جِئْتَ بِهِ 
إلا عودية. And this goes to show us is فيه استعمال العموم حتى يأتي المخصص. Is things that are general remain general until they're proven otherwise. Something that's general will be general. The rule doesn't change. Nature, the law of nature, as they say, it won't change unless we have proof to break that. He says, every time someone brought with what you're bringing, illa udia. So you're going to be kicked out of Mecca, even though I have knowledge of Isa and Musa. And that's isti'mal al qiyas. Is using qiyas. As long as you do this and say this, that's what's going to happen to you. If you continue to stay upon this road, you're going to end up with a bullet in your head, or you're going to be in jail for the rest of your life. Are you saying you know the unseen? No, I don't. But if you keep involving yourself with this, one of the two things is going to happen. What's the proof for that? Is that everyone who was involved in that is either in a cemetery or a jail cell. I want to understand this. Moving forward. It then says, When you yawmuka يَوْمُكَ أَنْسُرْكَ نَصْرًا مُؤَزَّرًا And if your day comes, I will ha, support you ha, vigorously. This hadith does not prove the permissibility of celebrating birthdays and the permissibility and the recommendations of having national days and days of independence and things like this as some people use mistakenly some people they use this hadith to say this is the permissibility of having an independence day this is the impermissibility of having your mutani this is the impermissibility or this is the permissibility of celebrating this day and that day al ihtifal huh that does not prove that if the day comes i will support you it has nothing to do with celebration He's talking about if he's alive, he would physically help out the Prophet These are some of the most important benefits of the story. And of course, the general uh, climate of the story is ta'allum and ta'lim, teaching and learning. And tawjih ad-du'at is giving instruction to those who will call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And showing them and teaching them what will happen. And bi ta'ala al-tasliya. It's to calm them down, to give them solace. And to tell them, don't worry about it. You'll be okay, inshallah. But know for sure that the road is going to be bumpy. The road is going to be bumpy. It's not a, a, a road of roses. Abedin, it's hardships, difficulties that you will encounter being a scholar, being a da'ya, being a teacher, calling your family to tawheed and iman. Everyone is not going to like you. And everyone is not going to agree with you. And it lies no doubt, the world would be a much better place if the callers to Allah knew this and implemented this. Everyone knows this, but implementing it. And that's because how can you quit giving dawah because someone talked about you? How can you quit giving dawah because your wife wanted a divorce? Because all you do is study and teach and call people. So she says, I don't want this lifestyle anymore. That doesn't mean you quit. You don't stop giving dawah because you can't go back overseas. You don't stop giving now because this sheikh is no longer around. Nah, abadan. You keep doing it. Even if you experience hardships, difficulties, and huh, things that are not pleasurable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. And with him is all success. We ask him by his beautiful names and perfect attributes to give us the success towards all good. To forgive us of our sins. To have mercy upon our poor souls. And to allow us to benefit from this story and all of the prophetic stories. Thank, I thank each and every one of you for your time, for your respect, for your attention, and for your, att your attentive listening, and your participation. Jazakumullahu khayran. To all of the brothers and sisters watching worldwide, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.